Researchers have found a petrified heart from 380 million years ago. Scientists have discovered a petrified heart that is 380 million years old. The petrified organ was found in the remains of an ancient fish along with a petrified stomach, intestines and liver. These findings shed new light on how evolution took place. In the Gogo Formation in Western Australia's Kimberley Plateau, which was originally a large reef, scientists have stumbled upon a 380 million year old petrified heart, the oldest ever found. The organ was found in the remains of a prehistoric fish belonging to the jawfish, also known as jawfish or jawfish from the group of armored fish. The petrified heart was found along with petrified stomach, intestines and liver, and the researchers say these specimens shed new light on the winding paths of evolution. The description and results of the research were published in Science. Kate Trinajstic of Curtin University said the discovery was remarkable. Considering that the soft tissues of ancient species are rarely found well preserved, and even rarer are specimens that have retained their three-dimensional structure. As a paleontologist who has been studying fossils for over 20 years, I was truly amazed to find a three-dimensional and beautifully preserved heart in a 380 million year old specimen, said Professor Trinajstic. Evolution is often thought of as a series of small steps, but these ancient fossils suggest that there was a much larger leap between mandibles and non-jaws. These fish literally had hearts in their mouths, under their gills, just like today's sharks, she added. Analyzers have shown that the position of the organs in the bodies of the hinged sharks, an extinct group of armored fish that also included the owner of the fossilized organs and that lived during the Devonian period, approximately 420 to 360 million years ago, is similar to that of modern sharks. Offering important evolutionary clues, this study presents the first 3D model of the hinged heart, which consists of two chambers, with a smaller chamber on top. According to Trinajstic, these features are advanced in such early vertebrates, giving unique insights into how the head and neck region began to change to accommodate the jaws, a critical step in evolution. For the first time we can see all the organs together in a primitive jawed fish. We were especially surprised to see that they are not so different from what you see us. However, there was one critical difference. The liver was large and allowed the fish to stay buoyant, just like today's sharks. Some of the modern bony fish, such as the lungfish, have lungs that evolved from the swim bladder, but it was significant that we found no evidence of lungs in any of the extinct armored fish we studied suggesting that they evolved independently in fish skeletal bones at a later time, noted Trinajstic. Using the latest technological solutions, scientists scanned the specimens, thanks to which three-dimensional models of fossilized organs were created, detailing the soft tissues inside them based on the different densities of minerals deposited by bacteria and the surrounding rock matrix. New discoveries of organs in ancient fish are truly a paleontologist's dream. Without a doubt, these fossils are the best preserved in the world compared to others of this age. They also show the value of fossils from the Gogo Formation for understanding the great steps in our distant evolution, said John Long of Flinders University, co-author of the paper. What is really unique is that their soft tissues are preserved in three dimensions. In most cases of soft tissue preservation, we are dealing with flattened fossils, where the soft tissues are nothing more than a blot on the rock. We are also fortunate that modern scanning techniques allow us to examine these delicate soft tissues without destroying them. Decades ago, such research would have been impossible, emphasized Per Alberg from Uppsala University, co-author of the study. 
The power of profanity. How does swearing affect the way you think, act, and relate? For a long time, the use of profanity remained beyond the interest of scientists. Experts assumed that it was simply a sign of aggression, poor language skills or even low intelligence. We now have plenty of evidence to challenge this notion, prompting us to reconsider the nature of the power of swearing. To understand profanity, researchers recently reviewed more than 100 scientific papers on the subject from various fields. Published in the journal Lingua, the analysis shows that the use of vulgar words can profoundly affect the way people think, act and relate to each other. People often associate swearing with catharsis, cleansing and releasing strong emotions. This is undeniably different and more powerful than any other use of language. For people who speak more than one language, the catharsis is almost always greater when they swear in their native language. The use of profanity evokes strong emotions that can be measured in autonomic responses such as increased sweating and sometimes an increased heart rate. These changes suggest that swearing can trigger a fight or flight response. Neurobiological research suggests that the source of swear words may be located in different parts of the brain than other speech regions. In particular, it can activate parts of the limbic system. These are deep structures involved in our memory and emotional processing that are both instinctive and difficult to inhibit. This may explain why people who have suffered brain damage and have trouble speaking can freely swear. Scientists also know that swear words attract more attention and are better remembered. However, they interfere with the processing of other words and stimuli at the same time. So there are many indications that swearing can sometimes interfere with thinking. However, sometimes it can pay off. In experiments where people had to dip their hands in ice water, swearing helped relieve pain. Research has proven that the use of profanity increases pain tolerance. Other analyzers suggest that vocalization of profanity may contribute to increased physical strength. Researchers emphasize that swearing also affects our relationships with others. Linguistics and communication analyzers have identified a range of distinctive social purposes for swearing, from expressing aggression and wanting to offend someone, to building social bonds. Using humor and storytelling, strong language can even help us manage our identity, show intimacy and trust, and increase attention and dominance over other people. Despite such a noticeable impact on our lives, we currently know very little about where the power of profanity comes from. Interestingly, when we hear a curse word in an unfamiliar language, it seems like any other word and has none of the effects described. There is nothing special about the sound of a word that is considered offensive. Hence the conclusion that the power of curses does not come from the words themselves nor is it inherent in the meaning or sound of a word. Neither euphemisms nor similar sounding words have such a profound effect on us. One explanation for this phenomenon may be aversive conditioning, i.e. associating the undesirable behavior with a painful stimulus, and in this case, the use of punishment to deter future use of profanity. Typically, similar punishments are applied by parents to their children at a young age. It is possible that this is what determines the strength of swear words and the relationship between the use of foul language and emotional response. So far, however, no thorough research on this hypothesis has been conducted and it has no empirical justification. To understand the impact of profanity on our lives, Scientists need to study people's memories of profanity and answer questions about important incidents behind the offensive words. 
punishments people received for using them and other experiences related to the subject. Researchers believe that swearing may follow a similar memory pattern to music. We remember and like the songs we listened to when we were growing up. This is because, like music, swearing can take on new meanings for teens. It becomes an important way of reacting to the intense emotions that usually accompany young people during this period. Profanity can also signal independence from parents and a relationship with friends. Thus, the curses and songs used during this period can be forever associated with important and memorable experiences. Further research into the profanity issue should focus on swearing memories and their relationship to bodily responses that can be observed in experiments. It would be especially valuable to compare people who have positive experiences with swearing to people with negative memories. It also remains an open question whether profanity will begin to lose its power as social acceptance for its use increases. An unusual case. A 36-year-old woman has already had cancer 12 times. Scientists have reported the exceptional case of a 36-year-old woman who has already been diagnosed with cancer 12 times. Researchers, looking for an answer to the question of why this woman is so susceptible to cancer, found an unusual genetic mutation that they had never seen before. Interestingly, it is this same mutation, the researchers say, that allows her body to quickly identify and eliminate cancer cells. Scientists in, Science Advances, describe the case of a woman who has already had cancer 12 times. In less than 40 years of her life, the patient developed as many as 12 tumors of which at least five were malignant. Each was of a different type and was located in a different part of the body. The first cancer, a sarcoma, was found in a two-year-old woman born in 1986. At the age of 15, she was diagnosed with cervical cancer. Five years later, a salivary gland tumor was surgically removed. After a year, she underwent another operation to remove a low-grade sarcoma. More cancers were diagnosed later in her life, bringing the total to 12. Interestingly, each subsequent disease was of a different type and occurred in a different part of the body, with at least five of the 12 tumors being malignant. Finally, Researchers from the Spanish National Center for Cancer Research examined the woman's DNA to find out why she is so susceptible to cancer. Scientists have found the mutation responsible for this. This mutation affects both copies of the MAD1L1 gene, which is unusual in humans. This gene is essential for cell division and proliferation, but its mutations are known to science. Family members of the woman carry similar genes, but only one copy of the gene. This is the first time that both copies of the gene have been found to carry this particular change. Interestingly, the double mutation of the MAD1L1 gene is usually lethal. We all inherit two copies of this gene, one from each parent, and while it is possible for someone to carry a mutation in one of them, Embryos that inherit two mutant copies usually die in the womb. To the amazement of the researchers, the person in this case has mutations in both copies, but survived, leading a fairly normal life. Never before has science encountered such a case. We still don't understand how this person could develop in the embryonic stage and overcome all these pathologies, said Marcos Malumbas of Spain's National Center for Cancer Research. The researchers analyzed the impact of the detected mutations and concluded that they cause changes in the number of chromosomes in cells. Under normal conditions, all human cells have 23 pairs of chromosomes.
In this woman, the mutation causes cell replication dysfunction and the formation of cells with different numbers of chromosomes. About 30 to 40 percent of her blood cells have an abnormal number of chromosomes. People with a rare condition called mosaic aneuploidy, MVA, have different numbers of chromosomes in different cells. Because most cancer cells have extra or missing chromosomes, people with MVA may be more susceptible to the disease. Birth defects and learning disabilities are also common in people with aneuploidy. Although the authors of the study say this particular patient does not have any intellectual disability. However, it has a number of other changes, such as microcephaly, underdeveloped jaw and nystagmus. The researchers were intrigued by the fact that the five aggressive cancers that the patient had developed were overcome relatively easily. They hypothesized that, constant production of altered cells triggered a chronic defense response in the patient against these cells, which helps to defeat tumors. We think that boosting the immune response of other patients would help them stop the tumor from growing, explains Malumbas. The discovery that the immune system is able to trigger a defense response against cells with the wrong number of chromosomes is, according to Malumbas, one of the most important aspects of this research, which may open up new therapeutic possibilities in the future. 70% of human tumors have cells with an abnormal number of chromosomes.